OA. Heather and Tony are the ones who are responsible for moving the telescope. They don't let the astronomers move the telescope. It's too expensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they're trained very well on how to move it safely. It's it, it's not a easy thing to do because you have to know very well about... Uh... Hi, Roger. Hello, future hope. Oh, Roger, you're muted again. <laughs> He's terrible. Mr. Evans. Hey, Walker. Hello. We have a new set of students at Future Hope compared to yesterday, right? Or were you all connected yesterday? Yes. All of you were. Sorry. I... The same people. You're sitting in the same place even. I should have read. <laughs> no. How are you? Um, yes. Hi. Hi. And um, it is 11.30 for you now, right? Yes. Okay. What time is lunch? One. One. Okay. Okay. How's the weather? I didn't get that. <laughs> I didn't understand that. Is it raining? Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. And very hot also at the same time. Mm. Yeah. Hot, hot, humid, and rainy, yeah. Mm. It's rainy in California, too, but it's not humid. It's and very not, cold. Yeah. Mm. It's raining in Waimea, or was raining just a little bit in Waimea. It rains a lot in Waimea because we're at the ridge. Uh, there's a long mountain ridge. We're at the top of it, and a lot of moisture accumulates there every day is, is it like a big issue for observations no because we're not close to the telescope right now the telescope is at such an altitude that many uh, most of the rain bearing clouds are below it <laughs> one of the thing that makes mauna kea so great for observing is that in there's a atmospheric phenomenon mm -hmm. called an inversion layer where the temperature actually starts to increase again normally temperature decreases as you go up and the temperature starts to increase again and the clouds like to accumulate there. But that level is below the level of the telescope. So that the summit of the of the mountain usually stays nice and clear of clouds. I will share my screen. And we are recording this session. From a town called Jaipur in India. Let's uh, let's let's have. Um, sorry, what did I do here? I would love to have the Astronomy Club of Jaipur introduce themselves, please. Can the astronomy club at what does it say? NMS Jaipur. Can you hear me okay? I forget what NMS, oh, Nija Modi School. I met Nija Modi's daughter and daughter-in-law at the conference I went to in India. That's how they found out about Chatter the Scientist. They run the school. So NMS stands for Nija Modi School. And it's their astronomy club who's joined. Welcome. Um, if, if you have a moment, Please unmute and we'll have you introduce yourselves. Um, in the meantime, would the students at Future Hope like to go around and say who, who they are, your names and what your favorite subject is and outside school, in school? We'll have to pass the microphone around. Yeah, there you go. 
sir, my name is Neha. And I studied in class eight. Huh? And my favorite subject is science and maths. Fantastic, fantastic. Welcome, Neha. So, oh, how about the girl to your right, Neha? What's her name? The one closest to the camera. Sanjana. My name is Sanjana. I study in class 11. And my favorite subject is English. Oh, yes. You spoke to us yesterday, Sanjana. Thank you. Hello, sir. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is my name is Shweta and I'm a student of class eight. Uh, I like history subject. It's Thank very you, interesting. My sister is a historian, studies the history of art around the time of Indian independence. Good morning, sir. My good name morning. is Adiba and I am from class nine and my favorite subject is English. Welcome. Good morning, sir. My name is Pew there. I study in class nine. My favorite subject is maths. Fantastic. We have to use a lot of maths in our work. My name is Roshan Das. I study in class nine. And my sub favorite subject is maths. Welcome, Roshan. Good morning, sir. My name is... Good morning, sir. My name is Roshad Ahmad. I'm from uh, class seven. And my favorite subject is English and maths. Fantastic. Welcome. My name is Mohammed Sabu. My name is Mohammed Sabu, and I'm I'm currently studying class eight, and my favorite subject is history. Welcome, Mohammed. Good morning, everyone. My name is Natik Sharma. My favorite subject is maths. Thanks. My name is Savan. I am from class seven. My favorite subject is English. Fantastic. My name is Dilshad, I'm from class 7. My favorite subject is English. Come. My name is Shahar, from class 8, and my favorite subject is science. Welcome. Good morning, sir. My name is Ayush Thakur. I study in class 7. My favorite subject is maths. Wonderful. My name is Sandhya. I'm from class 7. My favorite subject is English. My name is Mohammed Jisan Ansari. I do not have any favorite subject, but I love to increase my general knowledge, which are generally does not known by many people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. My name is Isha, and my favorite subject is English. Isha, welcome. Good morning, everybody. My name is Anisha Parveen, and I am I'm, I'm in humanities, humanities. I study humanism. I'm an art student, and I love all the subjects which I study. And I don't have a particular subject. I love all the subjects I have in my stream, like pol science, like history, chemistry, uh, English, all these, all the subjects I love. I don't have a particular one. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Sneha Singh from class 11, and my favorite subject is English and accounts. Fantastic. Very good. A very good morning to you all. And I am Suchana Santra of class 11. I am a science student, and I am very interested. I have a very really interesting computer. Great. Wonderful. I can study in class six. My favorite subject is maths. Thank you. Good morning, sir. My name is Jasmine Das, and I'm from class six. And my favorite sub subject is social science and science. Thank Good you. morning, everybody. My name is Andrew Kumar, and my favorite subject is general knowledge and computer. We used to have a subject called general knowledge in school. We sort of had general knowledge. I'm going to plug in my computer since it's running low on battery. But thank you for those introductions. Have we missed anyone or did we get, uh, get everyone?
Hello, good morning. My name is Roshan Shah. I study favorite subject is Hindi. Hindi. Good morning. My name is Abhay Kumar Roy. I study in class 11 and my favorite subject is accountants. Okay. Thank you so much for those introductions. I can tell you that um, the work we do, the work that I do and the work that Evan does, um, we are use mathematics a lot. We use science a lot, physics in particular, but some amount of chemistry as well. Um, we use statistics, which is, um, you can think of it as a branch of mathematics. We use that a lot. Uh, we use computers a lot program computers, news computers. Um, we use English a lot, actually, because you have to write. You have to write about what you found. You have to explain to people what you found. You have to write in a clear way. So language is very important. Um, and you'll find that language is important in almost anything you study in, in um, you know, inside and outside school, after school, when you're working. Um, language is very important. So I was very happy to see that English and Hindi featured very prominently as your favorite subject. It's a, communication is so important. A lot of what we do is persuasion. We have to persuade people to give us time on the telescope. We have to persuade people to give us money to pay for what we do. We have to persuade people that our results are sound and that the conclusions we draw from them are correct. We have to be able to write in a way that other people will believe us. Okay, so the Nija Modi school folks have, um, I'm going to read out what they wrote to me. Uh, this is from Nija Modi school. We will soon introduce ourselves, some connectivity issue, the mic. They're written by a high school at Jaipur, Rajasthan in India. Very, very beautiful part of the world. We run many clubs in school. Astronomy, the astronomy club is run by grade 11 and grade 12 students. That's one of them, and one of the clubs. We had a session watching Jupiter, Saturn, and the moon using a 10-inch telescope on Saturday and Sunday morning. Uh, this was organized by the club. This is a message that um, he wrote to me. Thank you very much for that. And I wanted to read it out for the others to hear. Hunter and Walker, welcome back. I'm missing Molokai a lot. Hello. 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 Um, we are currently uh, taking um, an exposure that has another nearly a thousand seconds to go, so more than 15 minutes to go. Uh, so this is a good time for, for you all to ask questions about what we're doing. Um, Yael, Evan, and I were just looking at some stars earlier, a spectrum of a star. Um, we could display that again if you want to see a spectrum that we took just an hour or so ago. Um, and you know, a spectrum is a fancy word for what you see when you look at a rainbow. I'm going to say a word in Bengali for future hope. The word for rainbow in Bengali is Ram Dhonu which literally means the bow of Lord Ram, but that's the name for a rainbow. Um, in Spanish, in Carlos's language, it's called an arco iris, which is uh, an arc of colors. Uh, but a rainbow is light from the sun that is naturally, by raindrops, um, naturally occurring raindrops, split up the act like prisms and split up the light from the sun, white light from the sun, into its constituent colors. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red is how we are taught to uh, read the colors of the rainbow in sequence. Um, what we're doing here tonight, and what we did last night, was we took the light of stars and we split them up into the colors of the rainbow. 
into 8,000 colors, not seven. Um, I'm going to take a pause here because I have to answer a phone call, but I'll be right back. I guess I can take over <laughs> tonight. It's a, a rather boring night. Boring is good for observing. It means everything is going well. If a lot of things are happening at once, it means that either the weather is bad or the telescope is not behaving or the spectrograph that we're using is not behaving. The spectrograph or the, the whole telescope actually consists of a lot of different components. One of them is the mirrors that are used to collect the light. So when they focus the light, they focus it onto an instrument. We don't look through the telescope with our eyes. We let mechanical instruments interpret the light for us. And so just like when you take a picture with your camera, I have a phone here. Inside this phone is a detector that can record the light. And that's what the CAC telescope does. There's a detector behind it. <laughs> Just like this monster behind me. Uh, there's a detector that records the light. It actually counts the number of photons that are falling on it. So the telescope itself is only part of the important instrumentation that's used for us to be able to do our work. It's the thing that's responsible for bouncing the photons around and focusing them into a small space. But then once the photons are in that small space, the instrument that we're using called DEMOS then spreads that light out into the spectrum, into that rainbow, and then records it onto a detector, a detector made of silicon, just like the detector in my phone is. People know what a photon is. Raj has asked if you know what a photon is. Future Hope, do you know what a photon is? Yes, sir. An atom consists of small elements, you can say, and a positive charge element is known as photon. Good, very good. Yeah, so matter is con consists of particles. In this case, light is not matter. It does not have any mass, but it still consists of particles called photons. So a photon is literally a speck of light. Bundle of energy. Small bundle of energy. Photon, not, not proton. P-H-O-T-O-N. Yeah, one letter different. Proton is matter. Photon is energy, speck of light. Please. Don't think it was directed at us. Oh, <laughs> oh you've got two video cameras. You've seen my screen share. I see your screen, yeah. You don't usually see other people's Zoom. You're asking photon. Yeah. yeah. Photon. photon. I tweeted the word in the chat, but it not, may not be visible to the group in a classroom to either to the government school or to the home. It is the smallest unit of light. Very good. Excellent. Do you know who discovered the photon? Who discovered the light is broken up in particles. Very famous scientist discovered that light should be part of this particles or bundles of energy. Very famous scientist. His name starts with. Won the Nobel Prize for this. Won the Nobel Prize. That's right for this. White hair. Unruly white hair. Say again. 
So it is a boson particle. When I discover, it is discovered by. Maybe that's what they were saying. They were saying that name. Oh, oh, are you saying Bose? Are you saying Bose? Are you Bose? She's nodding. Yes. Yes. yes very very good. good. So Bose and Einstein developed a branch of statistics called Bose-Einstein statistics. But really, Einstein, to be fair, Einstein is the one who really came up with the notion that light is become the electric effect. And proved it experimentally. Proved it. Um, now, um, Satyan Rinath is my wife, mother's, mother's, mother, cousin. <laughs> so my mother-in-law used to go to her granddad and ask her for help with silly math problems. He very quickly would explain them. Hmm? He was a very famous physicist who actually worked in a, he never had an academic job. He worked in a female hmm. government job in his life. Kind of like Einstein. Einstein started that. And then, hmm. of course, became famous. As and was. Wow. Did they work together or are they independent? They, they wrote together. books together. Yeah. Yeah. They never, I don't think they ever met in person. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, both wrote a letter to him in which he developed this branch of statistics and Einstein took that, developed it for them. So that's how both Einstein statistics was. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't think my mother-in-law knows the uh, full details of what happened, but there's been a lot of writing about it. Mm -hmm. That uh, Bose Einstein, everyone is writing on the board how minus one. That was from the number of photons. Is that the number of photons? Yeah. Number of Momentum and position. Yeah. Evan is writing some very serious math. <laughs> that, that is it. It's, it's, it's well over my head. It's not. It's really over my head. Sitting in a chair. It's over my head. But it's also the long, long time. Read it. <laughs> and I don't teach it. Yeah, I don't teach this anything close to that. This is exactly what I'm teaching, which is the only reason I was able to write it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that nice? They discovered this 100 years ago, and now people like me teach it in classrooms. <laughs> wow, there's so much going on on the, I mean, so, so the same, same thing that's packed into one laptop screen, you have seen it on four different screens in uh, in this room that we're in. We're in a room called Remote Ops 2, Remote Operation. There are both. These are the first screens. 
how you can see eight thousand nine in the in the um, R L I R S M. Maybe you should stop sharing your screen so that oh, it no, appears. No, you're fine. no, we can't hear you properly. Oh, sorry. It's because I turned the screen around. And now the microphone's pointed the other way. <laughs> we, we want to show you the physical space associated with the uh, variant. Oh, I should move my. Um, you know what? I should move my. Well, no, whoever is speaking, their their video appears big, but because it won't show my own video big, you know what I mean? Oh, so I think it, there, won't be, it, it will be in your own video if you ask it to. Right? I think it will. No? No. I think it will. I think it will. Can you, can it, can it? Sorry to make you dizzy. You can just click on that on three dots. I can pin it for me, but I don't know if it pins it for other people. I think, are, are, are you seeing? I should see it because, it because we're speaking. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I see. There's a spectrum of the star. Oops, don't look up my nose. <laughs> Who knows? Let's spin that. So these are the screens that are for the telescope instrument. This is the physical space we're in. Can you hear us okay now, Future Hope? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. How about the media mode school astronomy club? Are you able to sort out your audio problems? Are you able to speak? Can you hear? You're still muted. Yes, we can. Yes, oh, very good. Good. Future hope continues. Oh, future hope, but not oh. It's barely visible on your feet. Lean in, like oh, my nose again. Oh, good, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to turn the camera around. Time. A lot of computers in here. I just counted 23 monitor screens in this room. You can see there's monitor screens everywhere. Some over there. Some on this side of the room. The equipment in this room is expensive enough that it's a very uh, sophisticated fire suppression system. If you see this thing on the wall here, if it detects a fire, it floods this room with gas. Oh, shoot, I gotta go. All right. Okay, Tony, we can go to the next target. So I want to change the target here. So we just finished observing the first object of the night, the first main object of the night, which was called Barnard's Galaxy. We're now moving to a different galaxy called Andromeda 18. I'm putting the names in the chat. 
complete. The sky is divided up into constellations, one of which is called Andromeda. And this is the 19th galaxy discovered in Andromeda. Actually, no, more like the 23rd galaxy. Yeah, Walker, go ahead. The Banyard uh, Galaxy is Roger's favorite galaxy. I remember. No, favorite? my favorite galaxy is Andromeda, not Barnard's galaxy. Sorry, wrong one. Wrong one, wrong one. But it's okay. I like NGC 6822 Barnard's galaxy too. It's probably Barnard's favorite galaxy. <laughs> it was discovered by him, right? Or is that why it's called that? I presume so. It was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We have a few people here who haven't introduced themselves. You're welcome to unmute and introduce Advika, Mamelo, Darim, Ishita. Tony, we have the same uh, thing as the first mask where we know which uh, pixel the guide star should be on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mabello, where are you connected from? Hello, I'm Ishita. Oops. Ishita, you were, you were getting a little bit of an echo. Uh, feel free to type into the chat, or if you have a headset that could prevent the echo, that's probably not to work. But. Thank you for trying to introduce yourself. I appreciate that. How about you, Darin? Where are you um, connecting from? Darin, Madhvika, and Mamelo, feel free to unmute and uh, just tell us where you're connecting from and how you find out about Chat of the Scientists. You don't have to, but if you are able to unmute, that'd be great. Ah, um, thanks, Darim. Uh, Darim is from the Nijar Modi School in uh, Jaipur, India. Thanks. And I'm going to look up the names of the people who connected me to Nija Modi school, so I can. Okay. And I think I have the right guy star, and I put it to the position that Heather reported yesterday. All right, thank you. So Mrs. Arthi Modi and Mrs. Arpita Gupta, the two people who uh, I met at the conference last month who connected me to the Nija Modi school. Mm -hmm. Raja, do you think this would be a good thing to share the screen for? Yeah, absolutely. Ask alignment? Yeah, very good. Let me do this. Um, I'm since I've got, would you like to share or should I'm I? not connected on the- Okay, I, yeah, I'm on BNC, I'll, I'll share my screen. Should we look at the course alignment? SAT. Let's look at the SAT. SAT, okay. I'm not doing the course alignment. Okay, all right. So what Evan is doing is he's lining up the telescope perfectly, or he's attempting to line it up perfectly, and uh, this is a alignment process where the metal plate called a slit mask we're trying to line that up perfectly by controlling exactly where the telescope is pointed and how the instrument is rotated. Um, and you'll see- Exposure complete. In, in a few seconds, you'll see some plots appear on the left side of the screen. Um, and those plots will tell us how well the telescope is aligned with the part of the sky that it's supposed to observe. We're still waiting. CCD readout complete. Okay. 
few more seconds and the plots will appear on the left. You'll see a series of peaks. There we go. If you look closely, you'll see that all the peaks on the right. Oops, sorry. Are, no, that's okay. That's okay. You'll notice that all the peaks on the right, right were a little lopsided. And that tells you that the stars were all um, a little bit higher, or sorry, lower than they should have been, uh, a little lower. So the telescope has to point down a little bit so that the stars are now centered. And um, again, in a few seconds, the new exposure will be read out, analyzed, and now you'll see the peaks being better centered. Exposure complete. And you're getting the audio that says exposure complete, then it will say CCD readout complete. And then when the analysis of that re reading out, read out exposure is completed, it will show plots. In just a few seconds, you'll hear CCD readout complete. CCD readout complete. And then as soon as the analysis is done, you see these plots. Very well centered. Tiny rotation. Tiny. What do you think? Yeah, I would do it. Send moves retake. So we're doing, we are, we've applied a slight rotation to the instrument um, and we're going to retake, we are in the process of retaking another 20 second image. Uh, 20 second is the exposure time. And when the Exposure is complete and the readout is complete. Again, it will an analyze the exposure and it will present us with a new set of plots. So this is the process that's used to align the exposure telescope and instrument perfectly. Complete. Exposure complete, there you go. Then say so CCD readout complete and then you'll, you'll see on this screen in the upper right, you'll see a bunch of analysis results will show up. And as soon as that finishes, you'll see the plot on the left. DCD readout complete. Readout is complete. And then when the analysis is complete, you'll see the, there we go. Beautiful. Evan, this is beautiful. Wonderful. Ooh, that's some bad image quality. Yeah. Is it, are you looking at high MS? That could also be dispersion. Could be, could be wind. Yeah. Are you starting the spectral exposure now? So what Evan is doing is he's changing the config, you remember how, um, I think Yael, I was explaining this to you earlier that the grating is used like a mirror. So now the grating tilt is being changed so that it's going from mirror mode to uh, a mode in which it's spreading the light of the stars into its constituent colors to 8,000 colors. And that's this wavelength, 7800. As soon as this thing on the left has a green check, you'll know that the tilt of the grating has been completed. Those, these little symbols here are like gear symbols. It's saying that it's still working to tilt the grating and bring it to its correct position. Now see it's the check mark has appeared and now it should be ready to start soon. As soon as this green box here moves into the pink square, that means things are aligned on the spectrograph. We're going to mark base. You can see it overshot and trying to correct it overshot. Now, when it comes back in this window, it will, will start the exposure. And instead of saying idle, status will go from idle to exposing, meaning it will start collecting uh, photons from the sky. We have to wait for one more cycle for this green box to move into the pink square. And it's very close to the edge. It's just outside. It says seeking. It will say, go from seeking to tracking. The color will change from blue to green. As Soon as that happens with so the next update, I bet the green box will move in somewhere into this square, to this purple square. And as soon as that happens, seeking will change to tracking and the exposure will start. Almost there. 
There we go. Tracking, erasing, because it has to flush out the silicon detector, and then it starts the exposure. There we go. It started, and you can see it's counting up in seconds, up to 1800 seconds. So 1800 seconds is half an hour, and this is how it is uh, counting up. Any questions? Darim, it looks like we lost the connection with the Jamodi school. Um, for the lamps, how do you decide which ones to use? Uh, which lamps are you looking at? Uh, just like in general, because there is a couple of different types, right? And like you can use the, like one of them for both red and blue, and then one of them is usually used as blue. But like, oh, how yeah. do you decide which one to use? It's a good question for Evan. Art lamps. Oh, good question. Um... You mean for calibration purposes? Wavelength calibration. Uh, Yael was yeah. reducing some of the DEMOS spectra. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, excellent question, Yael. There's a couple of different kinds of ca calibration lamps in DEMOS. There's one called a flat lamp or a quartz lamp. It works a lot like a, a normal incandescent lamp. You get a piece of quartz hot enough and it... Um, particularly attuned to not having any emission lines or absorption lines in it, or at least not supposed to. Um, that gives us a nice uniform illumination over the detector so that we can look for inconsistencies from one pixel to the next. So if one pixel is a little bit more sensitive than the pixel next to it, we can calibrate that effect out. We also have the arc lamps, as you were talking about, which um, are the opposite. Instead of having a pixel, we have a bunch of emission lines at very discrete and very well-known wavelengths. As you send a current of electricity through um, a thin gas, a gas that's not very dense, you can excite the electric in the gas into higher energy levels. And when they cascade back down, they will emit uh, photons at very, very discrete and well-known wavelengths. And so for example, we have a neon arc lamp um, you might be familiar with neon lamps from advertising. You can have a, a gas of neon that you put an electric, electric current through and it'll glow. It usually looks like it has a red or an orange color. But that red or orange color is composed of hundreds of individual discrete emission lines. And because we know the wavelengths of those lines very well, we can find the pixel position on the detector where that, arc, where that emission line is. And then we know position corresponds to this very specific wavelength. Um, if we have a whole bunch of those, then we have a map of wavelength versus pixel position. And that allows us to determine the wavelength of every single pixel on the detector. And then you ask, why do we have different arc lamps? It's simply because some elements have lines in different parts of the spectrum. So neon has a lot of lines in the near infrared part of the spectrum, but not so much in the blue part of the spectrum. So we also have a mercury lamp uh, where there's a mercury vapor inside of this one. And uh, there's some really strong uh, lines in the blue part of the spectrum for mercury. We also have argon, xenon, helium. These all have lines in different parts of the spectrum. And so if you want, if you want a really dense spectrum of emission lines, you turn all the lamps on um, and uh, then you'll be able to have emission lines appear every other pixel or so. So the balance when you're turning on and off these lamps, if you want to have enough lines to be able to get a good wavelength calibration, but not so many that it's hard to identify which line is which. It makes sense, thanks. I got this as a crossword clue. Oh, yeah. I received, I got this as a crossword clue the other day, um, this. And the answer was 
this. What? What is this? I got the top one as a crossword clue. How is that a crossword clue? Like an anagram? No, it was a crossword clue. And the answer was R gone. R is gone, you see, from the top. Oh my goodness. I'm serious. It was in the United Magazine. It was a crossword clue. <laughs> We're talking about Argon, and that's what it reminded me of. <gasps> no. No. <laughs> in the same way that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yael, do you have Kevin Spacey on the wall behind you? Uh, that is actually Nicolas Cage. Um, oh. Some random kid at school last year was, he like printed out probably a hundred of just photos of Nicolas Cage and was just walking around passing them out. So now he's on my wall. Is there any reason or is it just to be quirky? I don't know. I never found out. I never saw him again. I just, I got a photo of Nicolas Cage and then he disappeared. Wonderful. Wonderful. You're a big Star Trek fan. I am. Yeah, we got these posters over here and we got those ones. I'm a Star Trek fan too, but I suspect I'm not as big of a Star Trek fan as you. <laughs> I actually haven't watched it in a bit. I should rewatch really it. I used to like watch it all the time. Uh, the Next Generation. I think oh, you when I was your age, this. I was obsessed with The Next Generation. The Next oh. Generation is very, very old for you. It's old. <laughs> Thanks. So, I have a question. Yes, please. Yes, please. Of course. Parallel worlds exist or not? This is my question. Parallel universes, parallel worlds. Yes. Parallel universe. Parallel. Um, there's some speculation that they do exist. Uh, call it speculation. Am I being unfair if I say it's speculation, Evan? Parallel universes. Okay. Um, so there's the. You, you see the term multiverse, where uni means one, multi means many. Um, Evan and I think this is speculative, that there's no not direct experimental proof that parallel universes exist. But it's, um, it's an interesting idea. And it's very, it's an, I would even go so far as to say it's an elegant idea because it, um, you know, there's this thing called the Copernican revolution where, whereby people realized that the earth was not the center of the universe and the sun was something that the earth was orbiting around. And then soon people realized that the sun was not the center of the universe and orbiting the center of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is not the center of the universe. It is, there are other galaxies. And by having our universe be one of many, it's another step in that same Copernican revolution. So in that sense, I find it aesthetic as an idea, but speculative to say the least. That's a complicated answer to your question. It was a very good question and there isn't a simple answer. You can read about it. You can read about things called multiverse or chaotic inflation, it's sometimes called. Are you going to ask another question? Please, please, please go ahead. Uh, so my name is Pain Singh. Uh, just I want to ask you the question that this multiverse concept, is it coming from the string theory, the membrane theory? I don't think it's coming from string theory particularly. Um, it is the people I associate with the these ideas are. I'll put some names in the chat. Evan, Evan I think of Andre Linde. Um, who else do I think of?
Linda is definitely someone I think of when I think about multiverse theory. It's not <laughs> quite related to strings. Is there is any way to detect the uh, some other dimensions in, in string theory and? Um, uh, I, I read somewhere that if the is in the particle accelerator, if the gravitons disappear, that uh, confirm the presence of uh, parallel or some other dimension apart from our dimension. Is you know, I um, these are, it's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to this, and I I know that there are people who have written books about this. Um, in particular, I would say someone like Brian Green who's a um, you know, Columbia professor who's written books about, who's written popular books about string theory and topics yeah. like the ones you're asking about. I think, does Brian spell it I-A-N? Um, I think he spells it like this, right, Evan? Um, Brian Green? I haven't done a Google search to make sure I'm spelling his name correctly. Brian Green, yeah, he's very popular. Yeah, he's very popular indeed. And I... Uh, have have I spelled his name correctly in the chat? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. This is a topic that is quite removed from my own research, and um, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to bring ideas from my own research to an audience of students to make them understandable, those ideas, even if they're sometimes complex and mathematical and technical, I try to bring it um, to a non-technical level. I'm able to do that, I think, with subjects that I, for which I'm familiar with the technical details. And since the questions you're asking about, but, um, in dimensions, string theory, these are not areas of my research and um, it would be, it's difficult for me to bring that into, um, you know, in, in, to explain it in a way that balances the fidelity of the concept, the truth of the concept with uh, making it simpler than all the math associated with it. Um, Brian, has done, Brian Green has done a very good job of this. He's not the only one. There are other people who have written very well about topics like this. Um, so my field of research is galaxies, trying to understand how galaxies form and evolve. And I try to understand them by studying the stars that make up galaxies, because those stars tell us many things about the galaxies. How they move tells us about the dark matter content of galaxies. Um, how they move tells us about how that dark matter can help a galaxy cannibalize another galaxy, tells us about chemical uh, chemical enrichment. Evan is a particular expert on chemical enrichment. So there are many aspects of galaxies and their stars that um, I would call my primary field of research. It's within the area of astrophysics. Uh, it's often called observational astrophysics, meaning um, astrophysics can be divided in terms of technique, can be divided into three groups. There are people who make measurements of the natural world, of the universe, people like me, people like heaven. When we make these measurements, we make them with a purpose, of course. We're trying to understand the answer to some question. There are people who build theoretical models based on physics, mathematics, statistics, chemistry. They build theoretical models of how, for example, how nuclear fusion works inside stars. Those theoretical models make predictions on how, of how these stars should appear um, observers like myself, obser observational astronomers, go out and make measurements to prove or disprove theories. So there are people who are observers, like myself, and Evan is an observer. There are theorists who build theories about the universe you know, that incorporate physics and mathematics. The third kind of astronomy yeah. researchers are those who build instruments to help the observers make measurements who are making those measurements to prove or disprove theories. So these three branches of astrophysics or astronomy are closely connected. I had a very remarkable PhD thesis advisor who worked in all three of these areas. He was able to build instruments. He still builds instruments. Um, 
He's written some famous papers about theoretical notions about the universe, and he's a master observer. Um, yes, Walker, you have a question. Walker, go ahead, please. What's the biggest galaxy? The biggest galaxy I have come across is a galaxy called Messier 87, which is the result of the cannibalism of many Milky Way sized galaxies. It's located about 50 million light years away in the constellation of Virgo. It's part of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. It's the biggest galaxy in the Virgo cluster of galaxies. It has a massive black hole at its center. Um, and um, I've spent some amount of my research time studying M87 and its outskirts. Um, that's not the biggest, biggest galaxy, but it's the biggest galaxy that's within a reasonable distance of us. There are even bigger galaxies uh, further away. And there are too many galaxies to name, right? There are, most galaxies don't have names. There are too many of them. There are numbers that, is, that um, people associate with those galaxies, but they generally don't have names. Thank you. Yeah, please. So, uh, go ahead, please. Ask your question. You are muted right now. Oh, now you're now you're unmuted. Please go ahead. So I have a question, which galaxy, I mean, which is the smallest galaxy you have seen in telescope? You know, the person who was in this room just now, Evan Kirby, has written papers about a galaxy that is very, very small, small in the sense of, has very few stars. The stars are not occupying a very large volume of space and they don't contain a lot of this mysterious dark matter. Uh, that galaxies generally contain. Um, there's a galaxy called Segway One that one of my other former PhD students studies. Her name is Marla, Marla Jiha. Uh, so it's not Segway One, but one of the Segway galaxies. So Segway um, is the name of a survey in which these galaxies were discovered. Um, so there are galaxies that are much, much, much less massive than our Milky Way galaxy. Um, millions of times uh, less massive. Um, so I don't think we quite know. I don't know if you've found the very lowest mass galaxy that's out there, but I can tell you what the, um, you know, what the lowest mass, what I'm talking about are the lowest mass galaxies that we have studied. We meaning astronomers have studied up to now. Yeah, I do believe in dark matter being an important component of the universe, that inflation is an important compo component of the universe. Um, when Einstein tried to explain things through the cosmological constant, there was a very important thing that was not known about the universe. When Einstein proposed the cosmological constant, it was not known that the universe is expanding. That was discovered by Edwin Hubble in the 1920s. But when Einstein first came up with General relativity, 1912, 1915, was not known that the universe expands. And this is an, uh, this is, I'm addressing what Darren wrote in the, Darren wrote in the comments. Uh, so my name is Prem Singh. Hi, Prem. Uh, so, uh, my question is uh, regarding closer. So what I come to know that uh, the quasars are cosmological objects, that they are very far object and they are the first uh, form from the beginning of, at the beginning of the universe. So how the elements are present in the quasars, if it is a cosmological object, and, yeah. and really a galaxy or something else? These are very good questions. So it's, it remains unclear whether the very first structure to form in the universe was a quasar or a galaxy. There's some debate about that. Whether the first thing to form were, were stars, an entire galaxy, 
or a quasar. A quasar, Q, and I'm going to put the name in the chat, Q-U-A-S-A-R. A quasar is gets its name from quasi-star. Quasi means not real, quasi-star. So people saw these point-like objects. They first thought they were stars, but then their properties were not at all like the properties of stars. When they took a spectrum, like we're taking today, they found that it was not at all like the spectrum of a star. They were different in many ways. Um, and so they, became to, uh, they came to be known as quasi-stars from which the name quasar came about. Now, um, today we know that what they are, are super massive black holes um, that are capable of trapping light within some region, but in a larger region of space around the part where it can trap light, material, stars, gas, dust, get shredded and form this frisbee shaped disk of material and the friction in that frisbee, the frisbee is called an accretion disk, but it's really shaped like a frisbee. The high friction in that leads to very, very hot temperatures and very intense glow. That is what a quasar is. Now, you're right that um, quasars were formed very, some, of the, some quasars were formed very early in the universe's history, not all. There are some quasars that were formed later, but, um, or at least some quasars that are still shining, including some that started shining well after the start of the universe. But there's some debate, again, as to whether quasars were the very first things to start shining, or stars were the first things to start shining, and whether those stars were in the form of galaxies already. Now, you're absolutely right that when the first objects started shining, much of the universe was made of hydrogen and helium, and most of the elements in the periodic table had not yet been formed. But those are formed uh, when stars live and die. So does that answer some of the questions you asked? That was a really excellent question. Sir, we know that the gravitational pull of Earth is 9.8 meter per second. Then what is the gravitational pull of black hole? Um, what is the gravitational pull of a black hole? It depends on your distance from the black hole, right? So the, first of all, I want to make a small correction. The acceleration due to the Earth's gravity is 9.8 meters, not per second, but not meters per second squared, meters per second per second, because the unit is acceleration, not velocity. And not only that, that is the acceleration on the surface of the Earth. If you were to travel a very high, large distance above the surface of the Earth, the acceleration you would experience is not 9.8 meters per second squared, but some other value. So the, uh, the acceleration that an... Uh, that an object like the Earth imposes on something depends on the distance of that object from the center of the Earth. In the same way, the acceleration induced by a black hole depends on the distance of the object from the center of that black hole. Evan, please feel free to correct me. I hope I'm the question was 9.8 meters per second squared is the acceleration due to the Earth. What is the acceleration due to a black hole? Couldn't have said it better. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> you could have said it better, I'm sure, but thank you. Okay, Darim has asked a question on the chat. I'm just gonna read this. Give me a moment, please. You know, there, the amount of controversy, Darim, over the value of the Hubble constant is much, much smaller now than when I started out as a PhD student. Um, people are still trying to measure it precisely. There is some discrepancy over the value of the Hubble constant. Uh, you are very well informed to, to know that that is indeed something that people are trying to, um, to reconcile, whether there's some new physics there or not. Um, I don't know what the plausible solution is going to be to the Hubble constant uh, controversy. But when I was a graduate student, people weren't sure whether it was 50 
or 100. Today, the discrepancy is over a few kilometers per second per megaparsec, not a few tens. Um, black holes do bend the light the telescopes receive, and not just black holes, galaxies, cluster, individual galaxies, clusters of galaxies can bend light, can and do bend light uh, before we receive them at our telescopes. Sorry? Sun bends light, that's right, the sun bends light. Sorry? It was a very famous Einstein thing. Einstein predicted that the that light rays grazing the surface of the sun should be bent. And um, a very famous physicist named Sir Arthur Eddington went out to make measurements of this light bending during a solar eclipse. Didn't make particularly good measurements, but he was a very a person with a lot of the scientific and political clout. So he came and announced that I've measured the bending of light and Einstein's theory is correct. But a few years later, um, so I, he did this in, 1919, Eddington did this in 1919, but three years later, in 1922, exactly 100 years ago, William Wallace Campbell, who was the director of Lick Observatory, led an expedition and made, that made the definitive thing. And he actually phoned up Einstein and he said, you know, I've made these measurements and uh, they really um, precisely show that the predicted value of light bending by general relativity is borne out by my measurements. I recently went to a play called Einstein about that was celebrating the 100th anniversary of this measurement. It was at Lick Observatory. And I've met William Wallace Campbell's granddaughter, who is an artist, who did this amazing chalk painting at Lick Observatory several years ago of her grandfather of the solar eclipse of Lick Observatory. It was a fantastic chalk painting. I remember chatting with her while she was doing this chalk painting. Walker, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Have you guys ever studied white holes? So, just like multiverses, Parallel universes are speculative, so are white holes. So are wormholes and white holes. Um, black holes are much more an accepted fact about the universe, but not so the notion of wormholes or white holes. Wormholes just to, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, those are speculative. Um, so, Hunter, no, telescopes can't unbend the light that um, um, produced by gravitational lensing. But what people do is they create models of how much light bending has gone on. And by applying that model, they can predict what it would have looked like without the bending. So that's become, an, not, not recently, for a long time, that's been an important form of research where you look at a distorted image of, of a galaxy or, or a group of galaxies distorted by the gravity of foreground galaxies, uh, one or more foreground galaxies, and then you build a model for how that light bending is going on based on your knowledge of the foreground galaxies. And if you can do that, then you can mathematically correct for, correct the distorted image to try and get a sense of what the undistorted image would have looked like if the foreground galaxy's gravitational lensing were not there. And this is answering Hunter's question on the chat, sorry. Uh, Walker, did you have another question? You have your hand up or is that from before? Old hand. So I have a question. Yes, please. How, how many black holes have been discovered? Oh. Many, many black holes have been discovered. The first black hole to be discovered was discovered by using X-ray satellites where people noticed that, um, that the black hole was swallowing material from a neighboring star. I wouldn't be able to hazard a guess as to how many black holes are, have been discovered so far. Um, I'm gonna guess. Sorry, oh, was that? 3C273 was the first quasar to be discovered, right? 
I, yeah, was that? They didn't know it was a black hole then, right? So, um, how many how many black holes have been discovered, Evan? Exposure what do you what would you say? Complete. Ah, stellar mass black holes. Evan thinks hundreds of black holes have been discovered. That's just black holes that are not at the centers of galaxies. Every massive galaxy that we know that's been studied in enough detail has been shown to have a black hole at its center. So there are two ways of answering your question. One is by saying how many black holes have directly been detected? And the other way of answering that is how many DCD black holes are readout inferred complete. to exist within some volume of space. My easy answer would be the total number of galaxies inferred to exist is very, very, very large, infinite, but um, inferred to exist in the history of the universe. But, um, but the number that are directly detected is in the hundreds. You put an image in the chat? Let's see. So if you can see the You can see the link in the chat that Evan has put there. That would be, I'm sharing that link. I'm sharing the image that's located at the link. That's beautiful. The blue stars here are stars that were discovered in gravitation. Oh, sorry, the blue image it. the blue circles are black holes that were discovered with gravitational waves you can see that every one of those blue circles is two smaller black holes merging into a larger black hole black holes can merge together and when they do they release a lot of gravitational waves which can be detected by this instrument called LIGO all of those blue points or black hole mergers that were discovered by LIGO the smaller purple points underneath it are black holes that were discovered not with gravitational waves, but with uh, photons, with regular light, um, largely in the x-rays, but also through other methods as well. Now, um, Evan, it looks like there's something like 15 LIGO events, black hole yeah, mergers. sounds about right. And I, I, I vastly overestimated when I said hundreds. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot fewer than 100 known black holes. But these are stellar mass black holes outside galaxies. Say again? These are stellar mass black holes that are not outside galaxies, but they're not at the centers of galaxies. Yeah, these are all in the Milky Way. All in the? Oh, no, that's not true. Not Sorry. in the Milky Way, so no. The purple ones are all in the Milky Way. The oh, ones, I see. The, the blue ones are I see. at a variety of distances. And the purple ones are discovered through X-ray emission, like from um, high mass X-ray binaries. I think that's the dominant mechanism, but I'm not sure. Although the, the spectrum we took, the third object we took today could turn out to be a Absolutely. binary companion and yeah. discovered through dynamics. So the third object we took a spectrum of today, one of our collaborators asked us to take the spectrum because it's a candidate for a star that could be orbiting um, stellar mass black hole. What was the third thing we took a spectrum of today? We first took two RLR spectra, Yael, that you know about, and then the third thing we took was, uh, oh, that's such a sweet doggy. Walker, is that, that's not Angel, is it? No, it's not. Angel is cuter. <laughs> Could be your dog, yes, that's true. I don't know your dog, I've met Angel. Angel is cuter to me. Is Hershey going to make an appearance? William Herschel dog? You think he's downstairs. He doesn't like going upstairs very much. All right.
to the Sorry. students of Future Hope. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, please. You're going to ask a question. Please go ahead. Yes. So my question is that is there any end to the space or is it infinite? You know, that's related to the question of are there parallel universes or is our universe infinite? Um, I, I believe it's related to those. Um, those two questions are related. Um, because in order to have multiple universes, the, um, they have to be finite. And I don't think we know the answer to this question. I don't know the answer to this question. Evan, this is over to you. This no, 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 is all no question. You. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, these are good questions. Um, go ahead. Uh, sir, how many years uh, does one black hole can exist? They can die or they're infinite? No, that is a great question. So uh, when black holes were first postulated, not discovered, they were first hypothesized by um, Einstein and his collaborator, Carl Schwarzschild, um, it was thought that they just continue to collect material and get, they can only grow bigger, more massive, bigger and bigger field of influence, bigger and bigger Schwarzschild radius, event horizon. But a very famous pair of scientists, Jacob Bekenstein and Stephen Hawking, you've all heard of Stephen yes. Hawking, they showed mm -hmm. that black holes can evaporate. They can lose material from their surfaces. Um, this is called Bekenstein-Hawking radiation. Um, you may have heard of it as Hawking radiation, but Jacob Beckinson actually discovered this before, um, before Hawking, and to be fair. Um, I think I once saw Jacob Beckinson at Hebrew University in Jerusalem um, when I first visits there. Um, but so black holes can lose material from their surface. This evaporation process is very slow and inefficient for most black holes. If the black hole is very, very, very low mass, then the process is more, if the smaller the black hole, the more easily it can evaporate. Almost like pools of water. If you put a tiny drop of water on the table, it has, its ratio of surface area to volume is so high that it can easily evaporate because you know evaporation is a surface phenomenon, whereas how much water is contained is a volume phenomenon. Uh, if you take a big pool of water, big bucket of water, it's not going to evaporate very efficiently. So even in terms of percentage of um, percentage of mass that's evaporated per unit time, a tiny drop of water is much more effective at radiation uh, at evaporation, sorry, not radiation, than a big pool of water. So small black holes, because Hawking radiation is a surface phenomenon. Bekenstein Hawking radiation is a surface phenomenon. So the smaller the mass of a black hole, the more efficient the evaporation. This is very technical. It was a great question. Thank you. And like Evan said, he, he wrote the Bose-Einstein statistic formula. This is something I teach in my class. So this is somewhat at the top of my consciousness. So I have a question, but what actually happens when something gets exerted into a black hole? The simple answer is we don't know, right? The simple answer is when something falls into a black hole, we are outside it. So from the outside, we know that a few things about that object, few bits of information about that object are preserved, meaning how much mass it contained, that information is preserved. You know, if a black hole had a mass of, um, you know, 20 solar masses and, you know, one solar mass worth of material fell in, now it would be 21 solar masses. So mass is conserved. Something called charge is conserved, you know, electrical charge is conserved. And spin, the rate of spin is, wrote, is conserved. Nothing else is conserved. Nothing else is remembered. Everything else is forgotten. And this is a very, famous theorem uh, put out by a physicist named John Wheeler, 
John Wheeler was Richard Feynman's PhD advisor. And he had a theorem that's called a black hole has no hair. And it's about the loss of identity of dark matter, of matter that falls into a black hole. John Miller was bald, wasn't he? He was bald and was actually poking fun at himself. There, Evan is showing you what a bald head looks like. Okay. But John Wheeler, which couldn't be seen because of our virtual thing. Let me, let me let's do this right. Showing you the black hole of my head. <laughs> so when John Wheeler was going bald, he wanted to, um, he came up with this theorem called a black hole has no hair. And here's what you know, I, I had the fortune of knowing John Wheeler when I was at Princeton. He was, um, he was a retired professor there. And his thinking was he was poking fun at himself. When he lost his own hair on his head, he said all bald men look alike, right? So there's a loss of identity when you lose your hair. And in this sense, he says black holes have serious loss of identity when they swallow, swallow material. That's why a black hole has no hair. That's the that's why that theorem is called that. If you look this up, if you do a Google search on John Wheeler, uh, I'll spell his name in the chat. And the theorem is uh, called a black hole has no hair. John, John Archibald Wheeler. Yep. <laughs> he even has bald in his middle name. And his theorem was called um, uh, black. This is an excellent question, again, about uh, what happens when things fall into a black hole. I've given you a fairly technical answer. I could have given you a simple answer. I've given you a fairly technical answer. So the three, three things that are conserved are mass, charge, and spin. Those are three things that are remembered when things fall into a black hole. Everything else is lost. A spin, another fancy word for spin is angular momentum. Charge, of course, you know, the charge on a proton is positive, charge on an electron is negative. That's what I mean by charge, or that's what John Wheeler meant by charge. And mass, of course, is the amount of material. That, what that means is if you have two identical black holes and you pour a bucket of hydrogen into one, 10, kilo, uh, 10 kilograms of hydrogen into one, and you pour 10 kilograms of carbon into the other, and they have the same charge and they have the same spin. The two black holes will be identical afterwards. The fact that one swallowed hydrogen, the other swallowed carbon, that identity will be lost. The identity of that material will be lost. According to this theorem of Wheeler's, which has a completely mathematical basis. It's not a qualitative theorem. Look, this, these are not topics. This is an example, a great example of a topic that's quite far away from my own area of research. So I do teach it, in an, but only in an introductory class, not in a, any sort of uh, serious theoretical or rigorous way. Yeah, please go ahead. Sir, how do a galaxy burst? How does a galaxy do what? Sorry, ask the question again, please. How do a galaxy burst? Um, I'm having difficulty understanding. Please say that again. One, more, one more time, please. Sir, he's asking how does a galaxy burst? Oh, burst. As far as I know, galaxies don't... Galaxies themselves don't explode. What explodes are individual stars. And if you have a group of stars go through um, sort of coordinated and very energetic explosion, that can drive material out of a galaxy to the point where a um, large fraction of the galaxy's material is lost from it. So that's the closest I can think of to a galactic scale explosion. Um, I can't think of any other way a galaxy would explode. That's what you mean by burst, right? Um, galaxies can burst into stars, meaning 
Uh, this is something called a star burst, where when a galaxy has an encounter with another galaxy, all the gas clouds in it, not all, but many of the gas clouds in it collapse and start forming stars. That's called a star burst galaxy, but that's not a burst in the traditional sense of material being uh, ejected from the galaxy. Excuse me, sir. Say that again. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yes, please. Sir, if a person dies in space and his body is thrown in the space, so will, will it ever get decomposed or it will be as it is? It's a great question. I recently heard a talk by uh, someone who studies forensics. And the title of the talk was, What Eats You When You Die? Gail, you heard that talk by Alison Galloway. Uh, it's a fantastic talk. This is a professor, a, a retired professor at UC Santa Cruz, who solved some very high profile murder cases, including the Scott and Lacey Peterson case Evan, that you may know in the Modesto area. So this is Alison Galloway. She's like, she's called by police into all kinds of investigation. She's helped solve many, many sort of missing people's mysteries when they find remains up well after the fact. She, she, her area of science is understanding how exactly the question you asked, how do things decompose and why and what eats what and um, in anaerobic respiration, aerobic respiration. It's amazing. She gave this talk where she showed images that were as gruesome as you can imagine. And, and she gave sort of warning beforehand that she was going to show these. It was one of the best talks I've ever heard. She showed this. Uh, she showed that the timing. I mean, so obviously her, she's providing evidence of when often the focus of her, uh, of her investigation is when did death occur um, in terms of uh, relative to when the body was found or body part was found. Um, She's actually saw, she's been involved in a few different high profile uh, cases, including I mean, Scott and Lacey Peterson, you know, that one. Um, there's a show on TV called Bones, which is, uh, what's her name? Um, not the older sister of the woman who plays New Girl, what's her name? Girl, you know these characters, tell, tell me what, who they are. Um, Oh man, I'm blanking on their names. Emily, no, no. Who, who's the actress who plays New Girl? Who plays the character, new, the lead character, New Girl? I have to look this up, sorry. Um, it's like Zoe Deschanel or something. I'm Zoe not actually Deschanel. sure. Yeah. Zoe and Emily Deschanel plays Bones, Brennan. She's called Bones because she's a forensic anthropologist. And I believe that character is modeled on Alison Galloway. So I didn't answer your question as to what happens when a, uh, when a person, if a person were to die in space, I don't know. We'd have to ask Alison Galloway. She would know. She would. Nothing would eat you, but you know, cosmic ray hits, and um, I don't know what that would do. Radiation hits. I don't know what that would do. Um, I don't know what the structural integrity of tissue is. I, I don't know about things like this. And when when it's not. This is a painting from future. This is a painting from future. Yes. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, uh, what I, what even little knowledge I have, I have uh, with that time stops inside the singularity of Big Bang, uh, your uh, black hole. Mm -hmm. It really stops. So suppose the black hole has certain mass at certain point of time, and if it is an engulfing mass from the nearby star, so inside that black hole, without the, any backdrop of time, so how the things suppose the charge or mass is keep adding or subtracting. So is there is any uh, difference of time of outside the black hole or inside the black hole that we are not um, 
what I say, we are not uh, incorporating. Yeah, I mean, I, I will, it's a good question. I don't know how to answer it. I can tell you that the external perspective, uh, the internal perception of time. Yeah. One more thing I want to like to add that suppose uh, even through the talking radiation, if it is evaporating, which is a surface phenomenon, mm -hmm. but sometimes it loses the mass, means to the uh, way of explosion or something like that. So if it is then certain changes in the temperature inside that. And if we don't uh, incorporate time with that, so I can't uh, get it yeah. how without time, the yeah. time of the is changing. It's a great question. I don't know how to answer this question. Um, I know that um, when we sit, you know, when people talk about time freezing, when something mm -hmm. Um, reaches the event horizon. That's the external perspective, external observer's perception of time. Um, time is not an absolute thing. Uh, that's one thing that comes out of Einstein's special relativity, that the concept of time is not an absolute. I'll give, um, um, I'm not answering your question directly because I don't know how to, but I can tell you that um, one of the things that was born of special relativity in Einstein's 19, 1905 is when he published special relativity. One of the things he showed is if you accept that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, a natural consequence of that is that the concept of time becomes relative. And I believe this is why relativity is called relativity. We often mistakenly assume that time is an absolute. What, what do I mean by time being an absolute? If two things happen at the same time, that's called two simultaneous events. What special relativity shows is that two events that are seen as simultaneous by one observer may not be seen as simultaneous by another observer. And uh, so time itself is not absolute, it's relative. And the external perception of time by an observer that's far away from the black hole. That, that person's perception as time is coming to a grinding halt at the surface of a black hole. That doesn't mean that an observer located at the surface of a black hole has the same perception of time. Um, so it's not, it's, don't think of it as time altogether has come to a standstill for everyone. No, it's only the external distant observer's perception that time has come to a and I use the word perception because time is relative. Does this make any, does that help at all in addressing your question? Thank you for the answer, sir. It's not an answer. It is really not. I haven't answered your question, but um, you've asked something very profound and you should, you know, there's a lot of, there is a lot of writing about this. And, Person. Yes, please. I think that the most powerful telescope is the, the James uh, James Webb telescope. The telescope is the most powerful telescope. Mm -hmm. What makes a telescope powerful, and what's the difference between a normal telescope which you use from Earth and a space telescope? That's a great question. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that the, uh, that the James Webb telescope is the most powerful telescope. Uh, the telescope's performance is measured in more than one way. Um, one way you can measure the performance of a telescope is to measure how sharp its images are or how magnified something is, how sharp its images are. In that sense, the James Webb telescope is one of the more, one of the more um, most powerful telescopes. It's not the most powerful telescope. I would say the Event Horizon Telescope that took those silhouettes of a black hole. That's probably the most, uh, the, that's the telescope that's one of the telescopes that's capable of producing the most detail. In general, this process called very long baseline interferometry with radio telescopes, those probably produce the sharpest, 
most detailed images. So that's one way of measuring the power of a telescope. Another way of measuring of uh, power of a telescope is how faint an object can we see. And in that sense, James Webb may be able to see some of the faintest things, at least in visible light. You know, there are different telescopes at different wavelengths. So X-ray telescopes, gamma ray telescopes, there's the most powerful X-ray telescope, there's the most powerful gamma ray telescope. So in this sense, you can't really compare telescopes across different wavelengths. It's not fair to do so. Finally, this how fast can a telescope collect light from a given object in order to measure something like a spectrum? And for something like that, the telescope we are using tonight is one of the most powerful telescopes in the world. So uh, Evan is putting up his uh, excited. But um, so it's not... Right, I think it's overly simplistic to say that the James Webb Space Telescope is the most powerful telescope in the world. That doesn't fully capture the complexity of that question. Am I being unfair to James Webb Space Telescope? Evan, what do you think? Okay. Yes, please. It's a little challenge question. I just wanted to ask that have you ever seen any alien or UFO or any uh, space living creature? Um, I don't think so. Not that I know of. Um, no, I don't think I don't you know. I, we get asked this question a lot, actually, as astronomers. We get asked questions about aliens and UFOs, and not that I know of. If it has happened, it's happened without my, um, without me being conscious of this happening. So, I, short answer is no. Now it is. It's lunchtime for the folks in Future Hope. India, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. You're five minutes late for lunch. Sir, I have a question. Yes, please. Sir, have you ever seen an alien? That was a question that was just asked. So talk to your friend who just asked the question. Answer is no. Yes, please. Sir, that in space and outer in space or any other galaxies, there are different level of possibilities to for different types of planets. I know there is a planet called 65 Cancer. It's made up of diamonds. When upper layer is all full of made of diamonds and graphite. Is it true that there is a possibility for different types of planets and different There's materials? Certainly, possibilities for planets of different materials. No question about that. Um, and um, I don't know how well established it is that there's a planet made of pure diamonds. That's, uh, um, that's, that's an, you know, again, that, that's an overstatement of uh, what was found. Um, but there are definitely, um, um, it's been observed that different planets have different chemical composition. Um, they have different equations of state. An equation of state is a fancy way of saying something like, you know, we think of equation of state as gas, liquid, mm -hmm. solid. Uh, in general, equation of state is a more complex way of describing the properties of matter. Um, so planets definitely have a range of equations of state, um, different chemical composition. So yes, they're not all the same. Even within the solar system, there's quite a lot of variation across the planets in the solar system. Where is your lunch room? Is it close by? Are you missing out on lunch? Sir, I have a question. Sir, I have a question. Yes, please. Please go ahead. So, how does star form? That is an excellent question. And I have a colleague, and there are many colleagues actually, but I have a colleague in my own department who studies this. I have a former colleague who is now in Australia who studies this. How stars form is out of gas clouds, clouds of 
hydrogen, mostly hydrogen in molecular form. And uh, when, they, when they get dense enough, they can collapse under their own gravity. Um, and when, once they collapse under their own gravity, they get more comp, by collapse, I mean, get, they get more compact, but they also um, increase in density and temperature, and they hit a point when they're able to undergo nuclear fusion reactions in their centers. And at that point, they can counteract the um, collapse. They can counteract gravity because that those nuclear fusion pr pr uh, produce something that's trying to make the star explode and gravity is trying to make the star implode and those can balance, those two forces balance and they become, um, and that's when a star is called a star. So that's the birth process of a star in very broad terms. In detail, um, there's a lot to be studied and understood, you know, how magnetic fields play into the formation of stars. Um, it's a big open question. There are a lot of open questions in the area of star formation. People study the details of this process a lot. Oh, yeah. Okay. Future Hope has to go to lunch, but we're going to check the alignment. Exposure I'm going to change my screen for that. You've just started check alignment, is it? Yeah. So it's going to do a, a fine alignment in those same boxes to make sure that in all this time that we've been talking and the telescope's been tracking the spatial sky to make sure that it's tracked successfully. So at the end of this exposure that was half an hour in length, before we start the next exposure, we're making sure that the, that the telescope is still tracking properly and the stars are still at the centers of those boxes, that those peaks are centered um, on in each of the four by four squares. And Yael, I'm aware of the fact that it's well past midnight for you. I know school is 12 hours away, but I hope you get a good night's sleep. You I'll go on a the readout complete. You should not get up for the early morning RLR observations. We'll do them, I promise. We'll see. Okay. Oh, I have terrible sleep habits. So I'm not a good person to talk, but I could still preach. You reply to my emails like 24 7. It's really, really funny. No, there's so many emails that I'm not <laughs> responding to at all from you and many others. So. I think when I emailed I you at them, like 2.30 a.m. once and you replied within five minutes. That does happen sometimes, yes. Well, you shouldn't have been up at 2.30 a.m. either. <laughs> hey, Oparajito. In about Hello. 10 seconds, we're going to see the results of the check alignment. DCD readout complete. Okay, and appearing now ish will be the results of the check alignment. On the left, you'll see whether or not the stars are in the centers of the boxes. There we go. Beautifully centered. They are definitely aligned. You notice how all of these boxes say no, no, no for um, these things here. That's telling you that it doesn't need an X offset, a Y offset, or a rotation. And you, know, you can see the stars are perfectly centered on the on the pedestals they're sitting on. The pedestal is the box. The seeing is very good still. Can I measure the seeing? I guess I, I, I'm, I'm not in, I'm in view only. Oh, this is looking very nice. How about a P? Let's do a P please. And then outer sky radius of 30. And then how about radial profile? Show radial profile. Beautiful. 
You can see the outer roundness though. I'm gonna see if I can read off the full width half maximum. Okay, we're exposing the next exposure. 0.5, uh, sorry, five pixel full width half maximum. That would be five pixel times 0.59. It says 0 0.71 over here, I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. This is one star out of five. Ones. True. It's showing you all five in that window in the upper right. All of them are point bigger than point six. It's still better than yesterday. Why is there an in sky and an out sky? Sorry, what was that up, Rajito? Why is there an in sky and an out sky? Oh, because that? you want to use an annulus to measure the background level. Inner radius of that annulus, outer radius of that annulus. What are you doing to the poor observing log? Mm -hmm. Am I going to it? Yeah. You don't like what I'm going to it? You, you added a line, but did you erase a bunch? No. Oh, yeah, because when you deep log, it puts all this header information. Got you. I might do the five and put the header, but I don't know. Oh, it puts a header for every page, right? Something like that? Well, you can, like, if you do deep log seven, it puts the header mm -hmm. goes through the last seven entries. It only does the last five. I don't know why. Oh. I don't want the header because I'm just appending it to what I already have for the log. I see. I see. So what you can do it shows you five probably because the header takes up two lines. The header takes up more than two lines. No. Oh, well, yeah, it depends on when you count as the header. Oh, I okay, okay. No, no, I see what you're saying. What if you did that, pipe it to tail minus five? Tail space minus five. And then if you uh, add that to the end of what you're collecting. I, I can't, yeah. Mm -hmm. I could do that. Make head or tail out of it. What's the order of operations if I do this? Sorry, I'm not seeing your cursor. I'm not seeing your commands. I'll, I'll come over. Oh, which which window are you doing this in? Here. Oh, okay. We plug seven, tail minus five. Yeah, that, that should work. works but i don't want this anymore oh because you already have it Oops. oh it also uh oh, i need to put a carriage return oh right right that's why that's why Tarim, are you located in Jaipur or somewhere else? Um, actually, I'm from Agra. But, uh, I Sorry, say that again. Uh, actually, I'm from Agra. You're in Agra. I see. I see. My sister-in-law um, was lived in Jaipur for most of her life. She's originally from UP, but she grew up in Rajasthan. In Jaipur, my brother got married in Jaipur. Yeah, great. 
Future hope girls and boys, I'm really worried that you're missing lunch. I'm getting hungry on your behalf. Are you sure that you'll get food after, after you leave this session? You're not missing out on lunch, I hope. Sir, shall we leave now? It's entirely up to you. You're welcome to stay longer. I just don't want you to miss lunch over something silly like Shadow the Scientist. <laughs> How long is lunch until? Tell me that. One. Okay. Uh, it's one. At one. It starts at one. And how long does it go until? One thirty. Oh, wow. It takes around half an hour. So then you only have 10 minutes left before it's one thirty, right? Isn't it one twenty for you now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh. You have to go a long way to your lunch uh, hall to the canteen. Yeah. Same building? No, sir. It's just beside this room. Oh, it's right beside this room. Okay. Very good. So I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. So how does plateau vanish from the solar system? Please ask the question one more time. How does plateau vanish from the solar system? Pluto. Pluto. Uh, you know, it, it hasn't vanished from the solar system. It hasn't at all. Pluto is exactly where it used to be. Well, it's orbiting the sun. It's doing the same orbit that it used to. The only thing that has happened to Pluto is it's in its classification of is it a planet or is it a minor planet? That's the only thing that has changed that people realized that there are many other objects like Pluto, or at least a few other objects like Pluto, whose properties are different from that of the eight planets, the eight inner, the eight planets that are interior to Pluto. Um, and when they realized that, they said, in order to be scientific and objective and fair, it makes sense to call these other objects, to put them in a different category. And that category is called a minor planet. And Pluto is the first of the minor planets to be discovered. And Pluto, is, Pluto hasn't changed its position. It hasn't changed anything about its properties. It's still... Um, it is what it's doing what it was always doing. But it, people realized that when they first called it a planet, it had been misclassified because it's unlike the other planets in terms of how it moves, in terms of its size. Um, it's much smaller than the, not, it's smaller than the rest of the planets and it moves differently from the rest of the planets. And in fact, it moves similar to, to some of the other objects that were found more recently. So they decided to call it a uh, a minor planet. Does that answer your question about Pluto? Yes, sir. Thank you. So, question. So, last one question. Okay, go ahead. By seeing the star, how could you identify which star is bigger and which star? You know, just by looking at a star, you can't tell which one is bigger and which one is smaller. You need to figure out. Um, other things like how far away it is uh, from us because um, something could appear to be very bright just because it's close to us and that doesn't mean it's intrinsically bright. Um, so how big a star is can be inferred from by figuring out how, how much light or how much energy it puts out and what its temperature is. Those two things, once you know its luminosity and its temperature, you can figure out its size or its radius. To figure out how massive it is, you typically need some other information. If there's another star orbiting it, then you can figure out how massive it is. But there are other indirect ways of figuring out its mass as well. That's a good question. It's um, not an easy question to answer. But um, 
I should let you all go get lunch because it is very close to the cutoff time for when lunch is no longer going to be served. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all again the next time you connect. We'll be doing this quite, you know, every night, as you know, for the next few nights. So we'll be doing this for the next several years, in fact. Not every night for the next several years, but we'll be doing this quite frequently, several times a month. Um, yes, yes sir. Yes. Be, uh, joining your session. So thank you for today. It was a great session, and we'll head off to have our lunch. You you all thank made you. it a great session. Thank you for the wonderful questions and all of the your attention, enthusiasm, curiosity. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Sir. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Good afternoon to you. Sir, I was so drunk. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Bye. Goodbye. Good night, everybody. I'll probably go to sleep too. All right. Yeah, you, you have school tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, our Larry will keep pulsing even while you're asleep. No worries. See you. Right, take care. Bye. Bye, Al. Aparajita, I have a bunch of news for you about the um, about Deborah. You you probably saw in emails. Right? Yeah, yeah. I got no, the email. I've actually I I don't know if I've sent the last email that I started drafting to Deborah. I don't know if I did. No, I think I did. Right in, in the one where I asked her when she's free. In the next few days. Um, yeah. Okay. That's good. the one I got. Yeah. Oh, good, good. I'm going to meet her in oh. person on um, Friday, but it'll be at a time when it's very early in the morning for you. We're meeting from three to four, which will be six thirty to seven thirty mm -hmm. your time. Yeah, that's really early. That's really early for you, and I know you're a late night person. So we'll yeah. re record the session, but more importantly, when we have Zoom sessions, I hope we'll do it at a time that's um, better for you. Yeah. Let's see what she says. Oh, by the way, um, can you uh, somehow enable downloading for the um, recording that we had of the, um, you know? Yeah, I saw your note about uh, that. Yeah, I haven't yeah. been able to figure that out. I've tried in the past with Yuja, but um, it, I don't, yeah, <laughs> I haven't been able to. Yeah. I, we can we can um, walk through that after this shadow the scientist session. I can share my screen. I can show you what I see. Uh, basically, Monsima wants to share that recording with her agents. So, if we were yeah. to, oh, I see. She wants to share it. She can view it through her UCSC account, but she can't share it. She right? doesn't. She doesn't have an UCSC account. Oh, we, we can get her the... one. We can certainly get her one, but that doesn't yeah, help yeah. her share it either. Yeah, right. Because she can't download it. Either. Yeah. I can. Um... No, I'm not sure what the solution to that is. Um, let's do that in a couple of minutes after after we stop recording. Um, no. Mamelo, we haven't heard from you at all. Would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Hello. Hi there. Right. Where are you connecting yeah. from? Botswana. Oh, Botswana. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Are you at the uh, BIUST or? Uh, uh, University of Botswana. University of Botswana. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Shipa is at the same place as you are. Yeah. He's the one who recommended this to us. I see. Are you an undergraduate yeah. student there? Yes, I am. I see. Excellent. Excellent. What are you studying? Uh, I'm just physics. I'm just doing a physics single major. I see. Yeah. Single major. I see. Which year are you in? Uh, fourth year. Fourth year. So this is your final year of college? Yeah. Okay. When does it finish? Uh, August next year. I see. 
I see. So you've just started your fourth year then? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, today we had a very vibrant shadow session. Lots of questions. Okay. Yeah. Not all of them were related to, of course, what we were looking at tonight. Many were not. But, no. Yeah. And I think, um, Darim, I think the Nija Modi uh, school connection, I don't know, was there a group of people in one Zoom call there or was it just, um, you know, they, they seem to lose the connection a long time ago and never reconnected. Yeah, I guess they had their classes for them. Say that again, please. Uh, they went because they had their classes. Oh, I see, I see, got it. Absolutely. I should tell you, though, that my email is completely out of control. And I am, um, so I won't promise a prompt reply, but I'll do my best to put it in the yeah, chat to you. Yeah, I'd be happy to share. Um, I can point you to resources at, at times, but I'm not always prompt with my email. All right, it is exactly one, so I'm going to stop the sharing and the recording.